Stephanie, how did you guys come together and what was your impression of this fine young filmmaker? <laughs> I actually met Justin through um, Jonathan King, a participant who called me up, and he knows I, I love young people, I love the new ideas coming out, and he said, you really should read this young writer, Justin Simeon, and I did. And how many years ago was that? God, it was six, six seven six, or seven so years. years ago. And it was great. We had a great conversation. We talked. It wasn't anything I really wanted to pursue, but there was definitely talent there. And the, and the funny thing about this whole, like this is such a full circle moment, is I had this script called 2%, which is about the 2% black, black population on a college campus that would eventually become Dear White People. But it wasn't good enough to like send to Stephanie Elaine. <laughs> so I sent her something else. But it, you know, it, it was the me, I, I kicked myself so hard for not having this ready, because this was more like what you were looking for. And I told him I needed <laughs> something that had something to say and that had heart. Yeah, and it was youthful, and I was like, oh my God, this is perfect, <laughs> except it's not in any way, shape, or form finished. And then, <laughs> full circle, my daughter saw the trailer that was up on YouTube, and she's biracial, and she was like, oh my goodness, you have got to see this. And I did, we all loved it, and then my assistant told me that Justin had a script and that I should definitely read it, and I did, and, and that was that. What did you love about it? What was, in his script at least, what was it that was unique or appealing to you well, about his point of view? It was completely fresh. He was saying things that no one was really saying out loud. It was bodacious, it was smart, it was political, it was social, it was the kind of movie that you read and you think, oh my goodness, we're gonna save the planet. You know, there's some <laughs> young people coming right. up that are grappling with issues and that was very special. Was it always inevitable that it had to be satire? Could you have made this film if it was any other genre or would it sound different? Um, I think you could, uh, but uh, for whatever reason, that's just sort of how it, it appeared on the page. It was always kind of comical, mm -hmm. uh, so it was always going to be funny or, you know, funny-ish, or it was always going to be comedic, I'll say. Um, but then, just in kind of developing the script, it was, a, it was a real decision. It was like, with satire, I can actually say something. It can actually have a bite to it. It can make you laugh, but also leave you feeling uncomfortable, and, and that can be okay, because mm -hmm. that's what great satires do. Um, and, and also, for me, it always had to be multi-protagonist. It always had to be coming, I, I, always, I always had to be talking about this thing of identity and self from multiple points of views. And there were perhaps a lot more when I first started and was a lot more, you know, ambitious <laughs> before, so, you know, the reality started to set in. So did Sam and Lionel and Coco and Troy kind of push forward? I mean, you, you said you were kind of an ensemble. Did they speak loudly or l more loudly than the other characters? And the, why did it kind of start gravitating to them? They spoke, they spoke loudly, particularly Sam and Lionel, who I kind of see as the anchors of the narrative. You know, if Sam for me really pushes us into the second act and Lionel kind of brings us on home <laughs> in the third. Um, and uh, Troy and Coco are, you know, kind of populate the middle a bit. Uh, and there were other characters, but those four for me just created this nice balance of point counterpoint, you right. know? Coco and Sam for me are, are flip sides of the same coin and, and so were Troy and Lionel. And that just, there was an economy to that that felt really nice. Can you talk a little bit about how social media played a role in actually creating part of the story and I think some of the dialogue in the film. Yeah, uh, you know, once I once I decided that Sam has this radio show because I thought she would have a very kind of, you know, vintage platform <laughs> uh, with which to, to, you know, sort of deliver her message. I, in my head, she had this radio show, you know, I was toying with the idea of it being Dear White People, but I just, I didn't, I had nothing. Like when I came home, you know, from my nine to five, I just, I had nothing, I had no jokes. I had nothing for her to say. And so, you know, what I started doing was tweeting from an account called at Dear White People. And back then, people, you know, you didn't see the actual person's name. So if you bothered you a little to, egg there. Yeah, if you, well, if you bothered to go into the profile, you would see that it was by this person named Samantha White. And I just sort of tweeted about events, you know, in the media. I tweeted to certain celebrities. Uh, I thanked white people for Mayor Hawthorne. I, you know, <laughs> I sort of just like tested out all of these jokes. And the ones with the most retweets are frankly the ones that we used in the film. Uh, the ones that we got some flack about uh, also 
also were in the film, including the criticism it, that it provoked. What was that? Was there a specific line or a criticism? Well, you know, why isn't there a Dear Black People was sort of, you know, <laughs> the main one that I thought was interesting. And the blacker than thou stuff, you know, uh, bougie black propaganda. A lot of that language <laughs> came from, frankly, people tweeting <laughs> at Dear White People. And so, uh, yeah, it was through this thing I was able to develop material, basically, throughout the days and weeks when I wasn't able to, you know, write properly. Do you think about it as a movie about identity or a movie about race or are they kind of the two sides of the same coin? I think of it as a movie about identity and particularly the relationship between identity and self and uh, you know the ways in which the self can be shortchanged you know to benefit the identity and vice versa and um, I'm talking about that with a with a certainly a black lens and therefore racism is in the world of the story and race politics are on the mind of the characters and gender politics are on the mind of the characters but at the end of the day they're all struggling with the same conflict and a lot of the conflict is is a lot about how mass culture responds to a person right because of the way they look and how that person looks at him or herself because sure. of the way they look yeah, I mean, uh, oftentimes, I mean, as a person of color, a person of any sort of marginalized community, I think that uh, life in America is, is constantly bobbing and weaving the culture's perception of you. And because of the energy that that takes, I mean, there's already an identity kind of tailor-made for you that in some ways has nothing to do with you, just depending on what room that you walk into. And I wanted to talk about the weight of that and how difficult that can be to, to navigate, especially as you're trying to form your own identity, right. let alone figure out who you really are, which is, of course, the ultimate goal. Um, but yeah, I, I wanted to say something about that. And then what's interesting is, because of the impact that, c that a culture can have on a person, we often feed back to that culture in the way that it, it expects us to. And I wanted to get into that too. What kind of resistance or interest did you find in the town itself when you and Stephanie started talking about how you get this movie made? I mean, I think the, uh, the funny thing is, is that m most everyone that saw it really responded to it positively. Some of them second guessed themselves. Right. And certainly, you know, when the script hit the business affairs departments, you know, they were, they were really second guessing it. <laughs> just because there was no comp for it in the last 20 or so years. You know, this, this stuff hadn't really been dealt with in, in a satirical way, uh, you know, really in, in several, you know, a decade or more. So, so the resistance really f was more about will anyone show up for the movie and, and who's the audience for the movie? And, you know, will black people show up for a smart satire? And will white people show up for something called Dear White People? And there was all of this, this hemming and hawing about, you know, well, if this didn't, nothing like this made money in the last two years, so how do we know it'll make money this time? I hope you save those emails and you could send them your box office grosses oh, from this so weekend. Good. It's so good. And the it's fact the that best. you are one of the best reviewed films of the year. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Stephanie, what else? Do you want to add something up? I saw. No, I mean, I think, I think he's right. Everybody thought it was really cool, really smart, really fresh, but they had no idea how to, how to sell it or sell it within their organizations. How did the actors' experience shape the film itself, and how did you find these actors, and what did you think they brought to the film that maybe you weren't expecting the film to say? Well, we, have, we had a really great casting director, Kim Coleman, um, who did uh, an amazing job out here in, in Los Angeles. And, you know, I love, I love the Quincy Jones quote where he says, you just got to leave the door open to let God in the room. I was very familiar with the characters already. And, and as the writer and director, I was very aware that, like, I could get too in my head about who they were. And I didn't want cardboard cutouts. Mm -hmm. I wanted archetypes that we sort of, that sort of become human beings as the narrative goes along. So I was looking for people who could not only give me what I wrote, but completely surprised me as well. And, and that's really what I was looking for. And you know, when, Ty like, when Tyler came in and he did the scene that we had seen a million times, read beautifully by fantastic actors, and he made me laugh in the scene. And I had never laughed in that scene before. And I didn't, I wasn't laugh I didn't intend it to even be comedic. You know, that's when I knew right. he was a kid. And, and there was a moment like that for each of them where they just right. completely brought like an element of, of humanity into the room that was not there before. And, and they just breathed light, so much life into it where I was like, who wrote this? It's so good. <laughs> <laughs> he must be good. Yeah. <laughs> and then as you're going the f through the film editorially, do you find yourself pushing more to the comedy or pulling that a little bit back? In, in other words, did the movie kind of take on a life it's, of its own that was a little bit different from the way you thought it would play and the way you thought people oh would God. react to it? I mean, you know, the editing process, you just mourn the movie you thought you made <laughs> for like the first few weeks. It was like, okay, that did not turn out as I expected. All right. Does not play. Good to know. 
And so, you know, for me, it was really just about, it was a balancing act because, you know, it, it's, 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 a, it's a sprawling script. It's a multi-protagonist right. story. And there were, you know, different parts of it that we didn't exactly get to shoot at all or execute in the right. way that it was written in the script. So you sort of, it, it then becomes about just making sure that the story is balanced and sort right. of making up for the things we didn't get and, and, and sort of like, you know, really using the stuff that, that was a pleasant surprise. And, and that's really what we tried to do. We brought in some audiences to, to watch different cuts of it. Um, and we just kind of talked but about it. But it was incredibly fast. I mean, this movie had two weeks of prep Wow. And and because we were trying to make Sundance, there was really after you guys came home, yeah. there was a cut two weeks later, and we're like, okay. So you shot yeah. in the fall of last year, then. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> That's unbelievable. September. I made your October deadline at Sundance. That's right. Crazy. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's crazy that you're here at the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. That's fantastic. With such a great film, Thank Justin you. Simeon, Stephanie Elaine. Thank, Thank you so you. much for coming in. Thank you, guys.